Today, I want to continue the discussion of the chain rule for functions of more than one independent variable. The situation that we had previously looked at was I have a function f that explicitly depends on x and y, but x and y also are functions of t. We label the branches with partial derivatives or ordinary derivatives as appropriate, and then we do the same as we did in the probability diagram. The total rate of change of function value f with respect to changes in variable t is then given by this formula obtained by multiplying that by that, multiplying that by that, and adding the contributions together. We've already observed that this seems to be leading us back into vectors and dot products. I want to look at a slightly more complicated situation now. Like before, I'm going to think of having a function that depends on two variables, x and y, but this time, x and y each are functions of two other variables. I'll call these other two variables s and t. So at base level, f really is a function of s and t. So if I label the edges of my tree with derivatives, as we've done before, I can think about this. If I hold T still and move the S around, what is the resulting change in function value? This would be the partial derivative of F with respect to S, regarding F as a function of S and T. As before, to find the partial of F with respect to S, I look at all pathways through my diagram that start at f and end at s. Partial of f with respect to x times partial of x with respect to s plus partial of f with respect to y times partial of y with respect to s. Follow the same pattern and you'll get a corresponding formula for the partial derivative of f with respect to t. Before we go on, I want to observe something about this pair of formulas here. Here are rates of change of f with respect to some variables, in this case s and t. Over on the right-hand sides of the equations, I've got partial of f with respect to one of the other variables and partial of f with respect to y. The other numbers don't have anything to do with function f. This and that, that and that are how the variables are related to each other. So there's two completely different kinds of information here. Those of you who know a little bit about linear algebra will recognize this. If I group these two things together in a column vector, and I group the other partial of f with respect to the x and the y into another one, this is matrix times vector. So not only are the dot products going to emerge also, but this shows that there's going to be some connection between what we're looking at right now and matrix vector multiplication. You can look at more complicated situations, but we don't want to become any tensor than we need to at this stage of the game. As an example of this sort of thing, suppose that f of x and y was x squared plus y squared minus 2xy, x is s squared minus t squared, and y is s times cosine t. At the point where t is 0 and s is 1, 
I'd like to figure out the partial derivative of f with respect to s, plus I'd like to know, and also I'd like to know the partial of f with respect to t at that spot. Since this quantity and that one are equal, and this one and that one are equal, I only need two partial of f with respect to x and y, I'll have to calculate a third number, a fourth one, a fifth one, and a sixth one, but then I'll just put those numbers into this formula and tell you the answer. Firstly, by direct substitution, when t is 0 and s is 1, x must be 1 squared minus 0 squared, or 1, and y must be 1 times cosine 0, 1 times 1, which is 1. I now know the x and the y value, which I need to know in order to evaluate the partial derivatives. Uh, since I belatedly realize that this is going to lead to a boring problem, let me retcon this f of x and y is x squared plus y squared minus 3 times xy. Then partial of f with respect to x is 2x minus 3y. And partial of f with respect to y is 2y minus 3x. Having fixed that, at the place where x is 1 and y is 1, partial with respect to x will be 2 times 1 minus 3 times 1, which is negative 1, 2 times y minus 3 times x will also be negative 1. So we now know that number, that one, that one, and that one. Partial of x with respect to s is 2s. Partial of x with respect to t is negative 2t. Partial of y with respect to s is cosine t. And partial of y with respect to t is s times the negative of sine t, negative s sine t. I need to evaluate these derivatives at the place where t is 0 and s is 1. Having done that, we now know all of the numbers on the right-hand sides in these two equations. So we can then finish the calculation and find out what the partial of f with respect to s is and partial of f with respect to t at the point that we're interested in. In Calc 1, one of the problems you looked at was implicit differentiation. In this situation, you have a relationship between x and y, but it may be too complicated to solve explicitly for y in terms of x. By subtracting one side from another, you can always get a zero on one side. In most locations, locally, the graph of this equation will pass the vertical line test. You can think locally as this representing the graph of some function in the usual sense of the word. The task of calculating the tangent line involves First, finding the slope of the tangent line, which is what this implicit differentiation stuff is about. If we differentiate both sides, on the right, we'll have a zero because the derivative of a constant is zero. On the left, I'm thinking of x as being the independent variable and y as being something that depends on x. The derivative of 2x is easy. 
in the next term, I have 3 times y. The derivative of that is 3 times the derivative of y, so that's not so bad. In the next term, I have x squared times y cubed, which is not so good. This is a product, so I'll have to use the product rule. The derivative of x squared isn't going to cause me any difficulty, but because I'm thinking of y as being locally a function of x, to do the derivative of y cubed, I'm going to have to do the chain rule on it. Then lastly, I'm going to have to use the chain rule to do the derivative of sine of 2x plus 5y. The derivative of 7, of course, will be 0. If we were to finish this as we did in the first semester, we would multiply out everything that can be multiplied out. We would group together all terms that have a dy dx in them and those who don't. And then we would rearrange that and solve it for dy dx. We're going to have a much, much easier way of doing this. I'm going to imagine that I have a function that explicitly has x's and y's in it. And I'm going to think of the y as being a function of x. The rate of change of f with respect to x from our chain rule diagram is the partial of f with respect to x plus the partial of f with respect to y times dy dx. If I've arranged it by subtracting one side from the other, that this function value is always zero though, its rate of change must be zero as well. If I know how to do partial derivatives, I can just write the answer down. The slope of the tangent line is the negative of partial of f with respect to x divided by partial of f with respect to y. Returning to the horrible example that we had before, and in the margin drawing my diagram, f sub x plus f sub y dy dx must be 0. dy dx is the negative of partial of f with respect to x divided by partial of f with respect to y. This makes dy dx easy to figure out. I need to emphasize that when we're calculating this sort of thing and that sort of thing, we are not thinking of y as being a function of x. There is no y prime of x over here on the right-hand side. There are a number of other variations on a theme that we could look at, but I believe that this is enough to get the idea across. Coming up next, tangent planes, normal lines, directional derivatives, and then maximum and minimum problems. Until then, I hope everybody's having a good day, and I'll talk to you again soon.